This is a mechanism of disease map for hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis. As in all these mechanism of disease maps, the color code key is up here. So each of the boxes will be colored according to these core concepts. In this video, we'll be talking about the definitions of thyrotoxicosis and hyperthyroidism, which are similar but um, subtle difference. We'll talk about the many etiologies of these conditions as well as the many manifestations for both of them. Let's get started with the definitions. Thyrotoxicosis is a state of high circulating thyroid hormone. So that means you have high T3 or high T4 and or high T4 in your blood, and this results in hypermetabolism. This encompasses hyperthyroidism, which is when you have an overproduction of thyroid hormones, again, T3 and or T4, by the thyroid gland. And um, it's important to note that hypothyroidism is a type of thyrotoxicosis, but there are other types of thyrotoxicosis that are not necessarily hyperthyroidism. For instance, you might be getting this thyroid hormone from exogenous production or from somebody taking too much of their thyroid medication. And we'll talk about all those cases. So it's important to keep these separate. The first group of etiologies that I'll be talking about are the thyroiditities. These are inflammation of the thyroid, and there are a couple flavors of thyroid inflammation, and I'll be talking about all of those. The first subtype I want to talk about is subacute lymphocytic thyroiditis. This is, on histology, lymphocytic infiltration. And the two main subtypes within this are drug-induced thyroiditis and postpartum thyroiditis. The drugs that cause this subacute lymphocytic picture are listed here. So that's alpha interferon, lithium, amiodarone, interleukin-2, TK inhibitors, that's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and iodine, such as when a patient goes to get a contrast study with iodine. All of those can cause drug-induced thyroiditis. Postpartum thyroiditis typically happens after pregnancy, and one distinguishing feature is that you'll have TPO antibodies, so you'll be able to detect those in the blood. One predisposing factor is patients that have type 1 diabetes. And note that both of these are immune, autoimmune problems. So it kind of follows that if you have type 1 diabetes, you're predisposed to getting postpartum thyroiditis after pregnancy. Um, and you'll have these TPO antibodies on your lab work. These next two I'll talk about are kind of iatrogenic causes of thyroiditis. So there's uh, palpation thyroiditis, which doesn't happen after physical exams, but it happens after somebody gets surgery on their parathyroid glands. So if the surgeon is in there manipulating the parathyroid glands, pressing on the thyroid gland while they're inside the neck, it can cause a palpation thyroiditis, and the patient can then have a thyrotoxicosis resulting from that. The other one is from external beam radiotherapy, or this radioactive iodine ablation, Either of those can cause radiation thyroiditis. So both of these are medical procedures that you would have done that might cause a thyrotoxicosis. The external beam radiation therapy can also cause a xerostomia, which is a dry mouth. So a patient might have that symptom, and that might help you differentiate between radiation thyroiditis and other types of thyroiditis. Another histology in the thyroiditis category is subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. This one's also called dick Vane's thyroiditis. And on histology, you'll see multinucleated giant cells, granuloma, and fibrosis. There are a few viral infections that predispose you to subacute granulomatous thyroiditis. These include the mumps virus, Coxsackie virus, influenza, echovirus, and adenovirus. So that's a, an, an association that's worth knowing. Now we're stepping away from the thyroiditis etiologies, and these are just miscellaneous etiologies. And <clears throat> again, I mentioned it's possible to have thyroid in your body that comes from outside your body. So this is one example. If you have ex excessive exogenous intake of thyroid hormone, that can cause a thyrotoxicosis. Now there are a few reasons that this might happen. Firstly, the patient might not understand their medication regimen and might take more than they've been prescribed. It's uh, also thought that some patients think that they can lose weight by taking more thyroid hormone, um, which they might be able to, but of course it makes them sick and it'll give them all of the manifestations that we have um, yet to discuss. So it's, it's uh, obviously not recommended, but some people um, take more thyroid medication than they should for that reason. 
There's also ectopic production of thyroid hormones. So this is when it comes from outside the thyroid. One possibility is in struma ovarii, which is when you have a uh, female tumor that produces this ectopic thyroid tissue that produces the thyroid hormones. Another is when you have a thyroid cancer that has metastasized away from the thyroid, such as in metastatic follicular thyroid carcinoma. This last group of etiologies all relate to the hyperfunctioning gland. So you'll see that this last group will all point to this box within thyrotoxicosis. So they'll all be hyperthyroidism. <clears throat> First on this list is toxic adenoma. This is when you have an actual nodule on the thyroid that's overproducing the thyroid hormones. And on scintigraphy scan, you'll see a solitary hot nodule. So that'll be an imaging result that will reveal toxic adenoma. This toxic adenoma is usually caused by a gain of function mutation in the TSH receptor gene. So that's the, the majority of causes of toxic adenoma that results in hyperthyroidism. It's also possible to get hyperthyroidism from a toxic multinodular goiter. So this was a single hot nodule, this is a multinodular goiter. And there are two etiologies of this multinodular goiter, and these are about 50-50% um, as to which one causes it. The first is a TSH receptor mutation, which results in autonomous functioning nodules. The other is more of a chronic condition, where a patient has an iodine deficiency for a long time. If this happens, then the patient will be chronically deficient in T3 and T4 because iodine is required to make the thyroid hormone. This results in the body's um, feedback mechanisms increasing the TRH hormone secretion. Remember, the TRH comes from the hypothalamus, which then stimulates the pituitary, which then stimulates the thyroid gland. So the body's going to go all the way back, increase the amount of TRH in an attempt to get more thyroid hormone. This results in a persistent increase in TSH. TSH is the one that comes from the pituitary gland. And eventually what happens is the body's getting all of these signals to continually produce more thyroid hormone that it will start autonomously making the thyroid hormone regardless of these signals. So it's almost like you've had iodine deficiency for so long and your body has signaled to your thyroid to produce hormones for so long that the body no longer listens to these signals, no longer listens to this TRH, TSH, and it just makes them autonomously. This results in a nodular hyperplasia, which is a toxic multinodular goiter, and you have hyperthyroidism for that reason. So even if this patient fixes their um, historic chronic iodine deficiency, they'll still have hyperthyroidism from the autonomous functioning nodular hyperplasia. Some distinguishing features for this toxic multinodular goiter are that they're usually painless and you can usually feel them on physical exam. You'll notice multiple papule, sorry, multiple pap palpable nodules. There are a few causes of hyperthyroidism that relate to beta HCG. Remember, this is the hormone that increases during pregnancy. Normal pregnancies will not increase beta HCG enough to cause hyperthyroidism. That's actually um, in these abnormal conditions that you might have a hyperthyroidism. So that's hydatidiform moles and choriocarcinoma that can cause such drastic increases in beta HCG that it actually stimulates production of the thyroid hormone. Next are situations in which TSH is elevated that cause hyperthyroidism. So these would be more examples of secondary hyperthyroidism. One example is pituitary thyrotropic adenoma. So this is kind of like an adenoma, but instead of being in the thyroid, it's one step back in that regulatory pathway. It's in the pituitary gland. So the pituitary is continually making too much TSH, which then stimulates the thyroid. Another example is in Graves disease, and this is actually the most common cause of increased TSH. This is when you have a TSH receptor that's constantly being activated by an IgG. So you make an autoantibody against the TSH receptor, and that should be able to show up on blood work as well. There are a couple things that predispose you to getting Graves disease. Sometimes it's triggered by pregnancy, um, there are also these two infections that have been known to predispose you to Graves' disease. That's Yersinia enterolytica and B. burgdorferi. One distinguishing feature of Graves' disease is Graves' ophthalmopathy. 
This is a classic picture of a person who has hyperthyroidism, but they also have eyes that are bulging out. And um, it's distinct to Graves' disease and not really present in the other types of hyperthyroidism. The pathophysiology is described here. You have TSH autoantibodies in the orbital cavity. These are the same autoantibodies that cause the TSH to be increased. Now these autoantibodies bind the TSH receptor and it results in lymphocytic infiltration, which starts an inflammation cascade where you have several cytokines that then stimulate fibroblasts to secrete the glucose aminoglycans. One of these is hyaluronic acid. And this one in particular has a pretty strong osmotic effect that pulls water into the space. And again, it's pulling water into the orbital cavity. So when, that, when water is pulled into the orbital cavity, it gives the eyes this bulging appearance. It looks like the eyes are popping out of the person's face. That's Graves' ophthalmopathy. And again, it's unique to Graves' disease because it requires these TSH receptor autoantibodies that stimulate inflammation and then stimulate fibro fibroblast production of hyaluronic acid. Next, I'll start talking about these manifestations of general hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis. These are two classic symptoms that a person with hyperthyroidism will have, excessive sweating and heat intolerance. Both of these are caused by increased cutaneous blood flow from the thyroid hormone itself. Thyroid hormone also causes increased appetite and weight loss. I've grouped these two together because it almost seems paradoxical that you'd have both of these. The patient will be eating more, but also losing weight. But remember that this is a hypermetabolic state, so they're able to eat more and also lose weight. This same GAG, glycosaminoglycan, can also be deposited in other parts of the body, and that can result in an infiltrative dermopathy. The dermopathy is sometimes evident in the shins, and when, when people have puffy shins or a, uh, an, an edema in the shins, it's sometimes called pretibial myxedema. The thyroid hormones, of course, um, are activating hypermetabolic hormones that overstimulate the um, adrenergic receptors, and this leads to a bunch of downstream effects. Some of these are listed here, tachycardia, palpitations, and hypertension. And these three in particular can cause heart failure. So if a patient is predisposed to having heart failure, and then they have this thyrotoxicosis or hyperthyroid event, they might then have symptoms of heart failure, like pedal edema and exertional dyspnea. The adrenergic overactivity can also cause lid lag. The mechanism through which this happens is spasming of the smooth muscle of the levator palpebrae superioris. So there's a muscle in your eye that is spasming from overstimulation, and that results in lid lag. Lastly, the adrenergic overactivity also causes hyperreflexia tremulousness as well. And it's typically a fine tremor, like a very fast moving, um, low amplitude tremor. Thyroid hormone can also affect your bones. T3 in particular stimulates osteoclastic bone resorption. So this might manifest as osteopathy and the patient might have fractures, especially if they're elderly, um, sometimes female, and they might be predisposed with osteopenia already. This can worsen that situation. Next, thyroid hormone has an effect on your sex hormones as well. So uh, when you have thyroid hormone increased in the body, you're gonna have increased levels of serum sex hormone binding globulin, that's SHBG. When this SHBG is increased, that means that your estradiol and your testosterone will be bound to the SHBG and the levels of free or unbound estradiol will decrease. So you might have symptoms of decreased estrogen. Some of these are listed here, like oligorrhea or amenorrhea, anovulatory infertility, dysfunctional uterine bleeding can all result from decreased free estradiol. Similarly for testosterone, um, if you have higher SHBG, you'll have decreased free unbound testosterone. In addition, thyrotoxicosis also results in an increased extragonadal conversion of testosterone to estradiol. So not only is your testosterone decreased because there's more of this SHBG, there's also more testosterone being converted to estradiol. So you kind of have two effects on the testosterone hormone. This might result in gynecomastia, decreased libido, infertility, or erectile dysfunction. Some of these causes of, thyro or of hyperthyroidism can cause diffuse smooth goiter. This is to be differentiated from the solitary hot nodule that you have in toxic adenoma 
and the multiple palpable nodule that you'll have from this toxic multinodular goiter. So if it's one bump on imaging, on thyroid scintigraphy, it's a solitary hot nodule, it's toxic adenoma. If you have multiple bumps, you can also see that on scintigraphy, but more commonly on physical exam, it's toxic multinodular goiter, and some of the others will have diffuse smooth goiter. Lastly, we can't forget that thyroid hormone has neuropsychiatric effects. These range from anxiety, emotional instability, to depression, restlessness, and insomnia. So this has been a comprehensive look at hyperthyroidism and thyrotoxicosis, including the etiologies and the many manifestations of this condition. I hope this was helpful, and thank you for listening.